Uh, we're very excited today. We're going to be presenting breakthrough research that uh, Mortgage uh, Banking Magazine will do an article next fall, and we'll be engaging a lot of the best minds for that article. Bob Chapman is a remarkable developer, primarily in great college towns and of traditional neighborhood development, in fact, the name of his company, that we would say is outside the system in terms of standard finance, um, often not conforming to conventional finance. Mark Troen recently led auctions of very large portfolios of failed loans, mixed-use projects, residential properties. He works to secure financing for new transit-oriented development, other projects, and he's an adjunct professor at New York University with much development experience in mixed use. And Justin Kennedy was co-CEO of LNR and is formerly global head of real estate capital markets at Deutsche Bank. And he's a colleague of Kurt Roloff's, who was the former chief investment officer at Deutsche Bank Reef, alternative asset management as a colleague of Toby's. And Kurt uh, and I and uh, Gary Paiva, we co uh, founded the invisible asset class with the intent to give visibility to a whole area of research, excuse me, of development, that quietly for decades, a great volume of investment has been done by community banks, foundations, self-taxing districts, Main Street programs, and they really add up to a great deal of investment in walkable urban real estate whether it's urban infill in transit-oriented development or new greenfield development, uh, what you see there is one in Atlanta by Jamestown Properties. And so today, though, even though there's a great deal of investment, it still is non-standard. It's outside the system. And why is that? The chain of causation is a fascinating conversation. It may be as mundane as how data standards are collected. Um, this shows you simply the data categories inside CREF C. And self-storage is one category, and mixed use is one category. And we know mixed use is far more complex than self-storage. And so with that complexity inside, mixed use and multifamily, the default often goes back to Fannie, Freddie, FHA and how they define the limits of mixing commercial with residential. And so what you see here is the limit of 15% of commercial that can be mixed with residential under HUD 221 or 30% or 20%, which is less, sorry, greater than a three-story building that might have commercial on the ground floor. In very small print, we're glad to give this to you, just at a time where you'd think Fannie, Freddie, FHA, HUD would be receding from dictating how development patterns are t happening. Uh, they actually are uh, taxpayer-backed lending accounts for more than 85% of mortgages in 2014, as projected. So this underlying, I will make a side note that the Live, Work, Walk Finance Initiative with ULI uh, Congress for New Urbanism drafted a letter. It was co-signed by many groups, and we will see, we hope, uh, within the next few months, maybe a year, some lifting of those restrictions. But today, we want to talk about not the regulatory side, but the private sector uh, performance of Live, Work, Walk and Walkable Urban we've, uh, uh, development. You can see that whether it's Scott Bernstein's research for major cities that transit walk sheds have performed at a much higher level, or whether it's in Philadelphia, uh, Chris Leinberger, who we're all friends with, who's part of this initiative, his recent walk up wake up call shows price premiums in all categories for walkable urban. And then what Mark Troen, we invite you to present, uh, Gary Paiva's new research that he did for the Fannie Mae portfolio of 40,000 mortgages. Mark? Thank you, Laura. It's a pleasure being here this afternoon. 
What we're going to do for the next couple of minutes is go through the literature and the research that's recently been published concerning live, walk, work environments. And hopefully we'll get that screen up now. Thank you, Todd. So for the next few minutes, we're going to see what the history in the literature has been and how we build the basis and the platform for this invisible asset class and how we support it and make it prosper, if you will, in the real estate environment. And we're going to look at the influences of land prices, look at the behavior of commercial loans and mortgages, even take a peek at what happened with CMBS uh, portfolios, all which will help demonstrate the issue of risk and default, which in fact is equal to or less with multi-use, mixed-use, and multifamily properties. By the way, this presentation and all of them will be available. Uh, U of M will provide that to you, so if you can't see it, uh, please bear with us. So the first slide here is really a simple chart. It was produced back in 1980 by Lee and Brown in the Land Economics Journal. And it basically shows the simple fact is that when residential development is near a non-residential activity, such as retail or some other amenity, the value is greater. Even when you look at eternal, external diseconomies and other factors that no matter where you look on the line, value increases the closer that you get. So the underlying fundamental premise is that this whole concept of walkability, live, work, walk places, has merit and value. So let's see what that means in terms of numbers. Subsequent to this chart, we're going to move forward to another piece of literature which is produced by Cochetti and Vandell in Real Estate Economics at 1999. And what this fundamentally shows is that over a 16-year period from 1974 to 1990 that mixed-use properties outperformed the other product types. You see industrial, apartment, office, retail, and hotel all were inferior to the returns for mixed-use. What's also interesting is you notice that if you look at the chart and the column, on a short hold for one year, mixed use actually underperforms. And we can understand that may be due to a variety of different factors, of course, given the complexity of the projects. But as you look to a five or 10 year hold, it outperforms all the other asset types. We recently received, courtesy of uh, Toby Cobb, information. He forwarded us the data that Alan Todd at Bank of America had put together. They looked at CMBS data, and this is on a group of a portfolio of $500 billion in loans, of which approximately $28 billion were what we'll call mixed use. And what you'll notice here in the chart is that both asset types, the mixed use, which is the blue line, and the entire universe of the portfolio tracked each other very well up until the bubble burst in 2009. And what's fascinating is that when you look at delinquency data, in fact, mixed use properties were 150 to 200 basis points better when it came to the delinquency issue. So here you have demonstrative data that shows that there is a benefit to those kinds of assets. In that same data set, they also looked at foreclosures and REO. And once again, the tracking is very close. The differential is a little bit better uh, in this case, but the point is that mixed-use properties, which are often perceived as being more difficult to develop, multi-use properties, in fact, do not do any worse and may do better. And I think that's an important lodestone for how we're managing this particular invisible asset class and hoping to make it visible. We have one more set of data that Toby forwarded to us from Harris Triton at Deutsche Bank. They looked at a $350 billion set of loans. Now, these were pre-crisis conduit infusion loans, basically issued in 2004, 5, 6, all the way up to the present. And what's really interesting, if you look at the bottom numbers there, there are two lines, multifamily and multi-use. They comprise a little bit less than one-third of this entire portfolio. The multi-use, mixed-use, 10 billion, the multifamily, about 85 billion out of the 350 total. And if you look at the far right, the losses to date, based upon severity, liquidation data, perform better, multi-use and multifamily, than the portfolios as a whole. If you look at the data, the mean is an 8% loss. Well, in fact, 
you're doing 20 to 25 percent better in the 6 to 6.66 percent range. And what this demonstrates, once again, there are lots of different factors here that we still have to look at. It's the, it's the beginning of the research set that it shows that this asset class, the invisible asset class, can perform equal to or better. So as we move forward, a lot of you, I'm sure, are familiar with walk scores and walkability. And now walk scores are an algorithm that's been placed, that's been researched and tested about the impact and the effect of properties when they are in a transit or walkable environment. And there was another test that Dr. Pivo and Dr. Fisher did back in 2011 that looked at the premium for real estate when you looked at those properties that had high walk scores versus ones that are low. Walk scores range from zero to 100. Any walk score that is 80 and above, it's a pedestrian-friendly, transit-oriented, walkable environment. Any walk score that's 20 and below, auto-dependent. You're in your car for the trips, even if it's just to get the gas or get the, the gallon of milk. And what these, these figures demonstrate is that the market value and the NOI for office, retail, and apartments exceeds those in, that is in walkable properties, of properties that do not have a good walk score. Well, this now leads us to the core of the research that Dr. Pivo has presented and we're talking about today. He did an extensive study using data that Fannie Mae gave to him. They, in fact, gave him access to data on 40,000 loans. And this data and this research was published just this past year. And Dr. Pivo looked at loan risk and sustainability features here. Now, when we talk sustainability, we're not talking about lead and environmental. We're actually talking about accessibility, walkability, commuting, those sorts of issues that we've been talking about. And his thesis was, can we predict mortgage default based upon these sustainability variables? So there's a rather complex set of variables. I'm sure all of you who have been in the lending or the equity side have seen dozens of variables. But in fact, what Dr. Pivo did was isolated those location-dependent variables that would have an impact and we could develop a correlation with the issue of risk. Now one of the variables is not dependent uh, on location, that's affordability, but the other seven are, once again, walkability, commuting distance, exposure to mass transit, adjacency to amenities such as open space and retail establishments, and he used that data in analyzing the data set. But before we show you the numbers and the results of this, I want to make sure everybody understands that he had to control. There are those of us out there who've developed the course all across the country and say, well, what about those neighborhoods that are better? What if you're in New York, Washington, Miami, or in the core of the cities? So what Dr. Pyro did is that he basically set the platform and he eliminated that kind of variability. He adjusted for location, for loan, for borrower characteristics, and even the correlation and collinearity aspects. And the result is what you see on the screen in front of you. In short, those properties that had high walk scores, that were transit-oriented developments, had a lesser risk of default. Let's look at the bottom of this chart. In fact, if you look, for properties that had a walk score of eight or less, which is totally auto-dependent, in fact, the effect on the relative risk of default is 120%, basically almost 100% greater than what the mean was for the entire basket of the 40,000 loans that he looked at. At the top, you'll notice that for walk scores that are greater than 80, it's 60% less. So think about this. This is almost a 200% spread when you look at the risk factors. And it's a compelling measure that says those properties, once again, that are walkable in our invisible asset class, in fact, are better lending risk. You'll notice there are a number of other factors in here too as well. You'll see that there's that item called Retail 16. It's measuring the number of establishments. This goes back to that first chart that I showed you, that adjacency, if you will, to retail and other amenities improves value. And in this particular case, the default risk is less as well. So what's really fascinating is to see that we can now demonstrate in an accurate, researchable way the benefits of these kinds of properties. So in conclusion, and I know this is just a brief summary of the research, walkability has material consequences. It's beneficial. And those benefits accrue to property investors, definitely on the lending side here, and we can by inference look at the equity side as well. 
Multifamily lenders, therefore, can mitigate their risk. And so it's interesting, all things being equal, and if you're looking at a portfolio of loans, and if you're looking at a portfolio that one has to manage, one can now look at these multifamily properties, the multi-use properties, and adjust those variables. In fact, perhaps deal with the lending terms so that you're still within the margin of the overall risk of the portfolio without any negative impacts. And then finally, lenders may in fact be able to offer more favorable terms as a result and still keeping within the book, if you will. So now I'd like to turn it over to Bob, who will show you the profusion of properties, the wonderful examples that allow this kind of development to take place. Thank you. Um, my name is Bob Chapman. I hope you can hear me. Um, I can hear myself, so I'll, I'll just do, do the best I can. Um, I'm going to be talking about walkable urbanism, which is something that is difficult to finance unless you can finance it outside the system. Uh, we all know that uh, pension funds and uh, college endowments uh, and um, family offices and so forth allocate a certain percentage of their corpus to real estate investment, maybe it's 5%, and banks uh, finance a certain kind of real estate investment. But the kind that's hard to finance is walkable mixed use. And the reason for that is probably because walkable mixed use um, has so many different variables. It's a basket full of all kinds of dissimilar things and people find it a lot easier to credit underwrite things that are um, standard. Here's some of the projects that uh, I've been uh, involved with. We, we built a, a small village next to Duke University's East Campus um, and sold all of our houses with one email in a, about a day. Uh, this is a village out in Arkansas for a, a small Methodist school called Hendricks College uh, where we put the first two roundabouts on a U.S. highway in the whole state and then um, uh, made the front page of the New York Times above the fold, which I was real proud of, and uh, attracted some great tenants, um, uh, Panera Bread, uh, Barnes & Noble, uh, and that's worked out very well. Um, but it was all financed from the college endowment. Uh, it was impossible to obtain uh, conventional financing on this project. We also built a regional headquarters for Southwestern Energy, which uh, paid for all of the stormwater management and created outdoor living, uh, outdoor learning laboratories, and also shielded the project from viewing a Walmart parking lot. Um, here's some more pictures of that project. Downtown Durham, uh, one investor, about two million square feet, uh, called Morris Ridge, uh, on property owned by one company. Again, not conventionally financed. Uh, this is north of Chapel Hill, uh, working in conjunction with University of North Carolina, walkable urbanism. Um, and this uh, is in uh, near Claremont, Florida, about three miles from Disney World, about two million uh, uh, square feet of commercial and 8,000 living units. Uh, this is an infill project in downtown Greensboro, uh, which was designed by Duane Plater Zyberg. My partner was the builder. Uh, and um, this has changed the entire nature of that side of the city of Greensboro. It would never have happened uh, unless the city had provided the land for free and local uh, civic-minded foundations uh, had provided uh, direct grants and the city provided grants, sometimes in excess of the cost of, of the buildings to get it started. This is a project we're doing in downtown Greensboro right now, which is called uh, Union Square. Uh, it will be a downtown university campus. Uh, this is a plan for an infill project between the two campuses of Duke University, uh, which we hope to get started on the very first small phase uh, shortly, which will be some pocket neighborhoods, residential. Uh, the university pays rent for its own space, and so it's not a, at all difficult to finance this, but there's no conventional financing involved. This all boils down to something that Chris Leinberger um, published a number of years back, which is that uh, there are possibly 19 standard uh, real estate types that are easy to finance, 
and all but two of those are essentially or fundamentally sprawl producing. Uh, and only a few of them contribute to creating walkable urbanism. Um, this is the um, transect which talks about appropriate scales of development in different areas and how you create livable communities. And here's some pictures of within the new urbanist world successful development that could not be financed in a conventional manner. Uh, there was no way to uh, attract uh, endowment or uh, pension fund money. Uh, but they've turned out to be great places. The first one was Ion in um, North Charleston, uh, in Mount Pleasant, excuse me. Uh, this is Baldwin Park, uh, uh, the Pritzker's project in Orlando. Um, this is uh, back to, uh, this is Vickery north of Atlanta. This is um, Habersham uh, near Beaufort, South Carolina. Uh, Vickery in, in Georgia. Uh, and uh, Hale Village Plantation in, in um, Gainesville, Florida. Uh, so you all know what this is, and you also may know about the opportunities. And I've got a few animated slides here that talk about places that look pretty typical today and what they can become uh, if, it if it was easier to make it happen. Um, one of my thoughts is that the credit underwriting process is such that um, underwriters can't deal with complex problems. But that may change uh, if you've seen uh, the press about the breakthroughs in quantum computing. I saw this great term, uh, adiabatic quantum annealing, where you can take a basket full of all kinds of different things and find the most efficient solution. So it may just be a matter of us um, waiting for our uh, analytical tools to catch up. Uh, these are places that have uh, typical disinvestment and what uh, walkable urbanism can bring. All across the country this is happening. Um, this is uh, publicly owned property in Berkeley, California. Uh, this is uh, a college town in Arkansas that needed a college main street. Uh, this is in Columbia Pike. Uh, Arlington, um, Memphis, Tennessee, and we even have something that happened right down the street here at uh, Wynwood, which looked like this, and you know what it looks like now. Uh, one of my favorite places is uh, Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, which uh, was pretty much um, typical nowhere, uh, and they adopted a, a citywide plan to create ur uh, walkable urbanism, and they won't approve anything that is not uh, following new urbanist concepts. So this is what's happening to uh, Mount Pleasant, uh, South Carolina. The new bridge to Charleston is at the end of this street. Uh, and of course, these were animations saying what could happen. And I was down there uh, a month and a half ago, and this is a, a building that's under construction, so it actually is happening. So the theme of... Uh, what we're talking about is that there is an asset class, it does perform uh, better, and the facts demonstrate this, uh, and the time has come for that asset class to be easy to invest in. Thank you very much. So we're going to ask you, Justin, to tell us in more detail the workarounds that you do for urban infill and um, to, outside the system, as Bob was saying. And then what would you see as the steps that would be necessary for this to become visible to Wall Street in a fashion that the single family house and the strip shopping center are? A big question. Hi, everyone. OK, on? good, it's on. Uh, they, so I don't have any slides or anything. Uh, when we found out Kurt couldn't make his plane this morning, I didn't have time to make them. But, uh, so hopefully this will be uh, cohesive enough um, that it can follow good presentations like the ones we've just seen. Uh, 
I started my career uh, before Wall Street uh, as a land developer um, out in California, contributing uh, to suburban sprawl in Sacramento, California, and in outlying areas of the Bay Area. I figured out a couple of things that didn't work. Jobs housing balance, as it was described by land planners and part of the goal of the county general plans, is not something that people wanted to be part of. Uh, they didn't necessarily want to work near where they live. Or there was a husband and a wife, and they worked in different places, and they picked the place in between as the place to live. Uh, what Jobs Housing Balance ended up for, there's an experiment you can look at called LA, it doesn't work, uh, that what happens is everybody gets in their car at 5 o'clock and drives every different direction, and there's no way to create transportation infrastructure that it's dense enough uh, that you can really make mass transit work. Now, obviously, there are, they are making mass tra transit investments in downtown LA to downtown LA. Uh, they're focusing very intense new developments in downtown LA and have created uh, successful, uh, let's call it multi-decade uh, lead time projects uh, that are helping the traffic situation in LA. The interesting thing that's happening in LA is that the hottest investment area in downtown uh, or in the, in, in the, in the LA market uh, is in downtown uh, where a couple restaurants, a couple edgy hotels were leaders. Obviously this is something we've seen here in Miami as well. Uh, the work that, uh, that the Robbins organization has done up in the design district, what happened with Comrades Company and a couple others along Lincoln Road um, in South Beach that walkable recreations of urban environments are things that, uh, you know, that we have maybe here in Miami more successful examples of than in other, let's call it, previously sprawl-oriented communities. Uh, Obviously, on a larger scale, and a, uh, let's call it hyper-walkable scale, what's happening here around the city center development in the, let's call it North Brickell uh, area is something I don't think is going on in any other country, uh, any other market in the country that at least I'm aware of. Um, that, that and uh, it, that the change that's occurred in Brickell in just three years since I've lived here, moved here from New York in 10, is uh, something that's phenomenal. Uh, we were lucky enough to participate in a project uh, in, um, in Brickell, um, building on the air rights over the Mary Brickell Center that I, I think LNR will find to be one of its more successful investments uh, in recent times. So that the question I think is, and we have also uh, directed our work at Grass River to finding these walkable transit-oriented locations and developing mixed use and uh, residential projects in these urban infill areas that are served by existing transit uh, I I infrastructure. Um, I think the question was, based on my years as a Wall Street guy, and I think replacing Kurt as a Wall Street guy on the panel, is how do we bring capital more effectively to these kinds of investments? And I, I, you know, Toby, my partner, I, I drive crazy all the time by saying that there, you know, are, there are fixed things in the market that tend to drive, let's call it investments towards uh, particular areas that tend to spur bubbles. And I think this is true across all investment classes, not just in real estate, uh, but it also happens to be true in real estate. Um, that from the perspective of financing and the, uh, and the statistics that were shown on the screen, and that was the first time I've seen them, that my reaction to that is, is that okay, the, the, the interesting thing about multifamily in the CMBS markets, which I believe are the source of that data, is that those, that data is incredibly skewed because of the earlier fact that we heard that actually Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac provide subsidized financing to 75% of all multifamily projects. And so by definition, the market rate financing available to CMBS markets or CMBS borrowers is, the guys are there for a reason. They couldn't get a loan from Fannie Mae for a reason. Um, I believe, and Toby stopped me or one of the other panelists knows the answer to this, 
that it's about 25% non-multi uh, cash flow is the limit for any of the GSEs making a loan. That's, it's, it's in that range. Um, Toby, you might remember. 20% credit back, 25% credit back. Okay, so that, the, that, that as a CMBS lender was great for us in Queens because high volume retail stores on street fronts in Queens allowed us to uh, you know, lend on high quality multifamily streams but that made up more than 20% or 25% of the strategy. So that was an opportunity for us to get high quality infill projects we wouldn't get otherwise. Um, the interesting things about making the initial investment in the type of community, let's call it redevelopment uh, slides that we saw, is that initial investment is something a banker can never get his head around. So if you're I think it's Sam Cho uh, up in Wynwood making the first investments in Wynwood. Wells Fargo Bank's not looking at you for a loan for that unless you're personally guaranteed 100% on that investment. Additionally, the institutional capital that really dominates markets uh, across the equity spectrum, urban infill recreation is not a big asset class at CalPERS. Um, I'm not picking on them in general, just as the largest institutional investor um, in these markets, it, that is not a big asset class for them. I'm sure that they do have a social uh, fund, a, 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 an infill fund, um, but it's not one of their big funds. They have a huge multifamily fund, a huge office fund. This type of equity investment is not really easy for an institutional investor to get their head around. And so that pushing uh, developments towards this type of walkable character can really only happen in a place where either you're going to serve it with super dense transportation capacity or where there's already an existing jobs center like a, uh, like a, a brickle um, that you're going to serve. Um, and that the problem with making that investment as an entrepreneur is that that land tends to have a very high land price associated with it. So being the pioneer in that location is very risky. Uh, right now, we're, uh, we have the opportunity to be looking at a very uh, attractive project in Orlando across the street, an infill lot, the last lot to be developed on the ring road around Millennium Mall. I think we're going to be able to get a lot of lenders and institutions to look at that deal. At the same time, uh, we are about to break ground on a project on US-1 right next to the, uh, the Coconut Grove train station that has been harder to get institutional investors and lenders to look at than the, this, this Orlando site will be despite the fact that the Coconut Grove site on US-1 next to the train station is infill because we had to pay so much more for the land. Now, we believe in it. We think it's a location that will have rising rents. There's very little ability for others to create a, a, a competitive product, but it's taking more risk. And I think the challenge is for institutional investors, particularly on the equity side, to say, we believe in walkability. We believe in sustainability of the communities that we're investing in. We want to de-emphasize sprawl, and we want to emphasize sustainability and walkability. But how that happens, I think, has to be led by the academic community. And I think University of Miami should be applauded not only for the new urbanism studies, but the maybe more financial focus that's coming here. Well, in this group, and um, we are working to access other portfolios that Dr. Paivo can get his hands on to a CMBS portfolio to run a similar analysis that he did for the 40,000 mortgages inside uh, Fannie Mae. And um, so as we gather up and stimulate other research, uh, working with University of Miami, University of Arizona, uh, New York University. 
What role do you think uh, Moody's and an underwriter might play to start engaging them in the conversation? And I, I'm talking about how do we accelerate? Because it took us 20 years to redesign infrastructure and zoning reform and figure out street standards such that the districts where you're developing have had the transit in place and the public-private partnership in, the, um, in place, and there gives a certain amount of starting point. It took a very long time for new urbanists and private and public sector to come together and uh, achieve the sort of um, standards and reforms that were necessary to let new kind of infrastructure be built. So when you switch over and say, the existing data collection, underwriting, asset classes, the way loans are originated, are leaving out a number of building types. The entry point may be a little too much for a CREPC or a NACREP to try to modify. But would, the, would Moody's, and I want to ask this of Mark too, and a rating agency be an entry point? Well, if you, if you would give like your typical loan underwriter about a three on the creativity scale, maybe 2.8 is, uh, is your rating agency guy. So, uh, and hopefully there's, maybe he's offended by that. But to do volume, it's gotta fit in a box, yeah. right? If you don't have a box, it can't be volume. It has to be special. And that the question, I think, and maybe the source of the study is, and I think maybe we saw it in the data, that the early years mixed-use projects fail at a higher rate, but if they win, they tend to be, actually have a better, uh, have a better track record, which would, they have kind of fits with. But, but let me pick up on what you just mentioned, and that is that we're talking about the box, I'm gonna call it the black box, because when you look at Moody's or any of the other rating agencies, Frankly, the criteria that they've used over the last 20, 30, 40 years have been based on a set of variables that are, frankly, irrelevant to this invisible asset class. And so I think by Dr. Pivo's research and others, in fact, the organizations, the institutions like U of M and others have to reinvent the black box and say, here are the variables that make sense, like the eight that we put up on the screen. And if we use that and can demonstrate the benefits, the equity, and the debt, as you were just mentioning, then you set the stage for the Moody's and the others to say, this is viable. I don't think there's any other way to do it. Otherwise, you're going to continually be compared to the self-storage units, uh, to the strip or convenience retail, which simply is operated under a different set of criteria. So the black box, I think, is important. And it's not so much mysterious so much as creating that and running it many times over. Well, I think that, I, actually, if I was going to give creativity and thoughtfulness score to one person actually involved in the markets in CMBS, the guy that actually runs research at Moody's, Tad Phillips, I would give a very high score to. He is an incredibly thoughtful guy. Um, and actually, he has a statistic that when run against CMBS defaults is actually performing a little bit better. Their stressed LTV number is actually working out a lot better than reported LTV or reported LTVR, uh, 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 reported LTV as a, uh, as a, a powerful uh, uh, predictor of default. So that, that is, uh, so that if there's one guy that you could go to to say, hey, you need to put a walkability and in, in a, urban sustainability score to your properties, that you should put that as a factor in your model. If there's one guy that would be creative enough to look at it, it's actually him. So um, I'm not just, s and I'm not as familiar with their work, but I, that it might be that, there's, that, that, that that's an opportunity as well. So we're calling Tad Phillips on Monday, and we're calling uh, your friend Mr. Phillips at uh, Moody's on Monday. And um, this conversation will continue. The U.S. Conference of Mayors has engaged. Uh, we'll ha we have a number of foundations who've engaged. Uh, the, we'll have these best minds conversations in tight groups. It'll be reported on in Morgan Banking Magazine. And we invite you um, to consider this a start of this initiative. And thank you for letting us introduce this research at University of Miami. Thank you. Thank you. You did great. Very good. So glad you came.